All right, welcome everybody to the fifth session of the ISIS Oliver Congress at 50. We are very pleased to have all of you here and we are especially happy that so many of you are joining us on this very special day, which is the second day of our Oliver Congress at 50 event. Now, my name is Arabella. I am the Communications and Outreach Officer here at the ISIS HQ in Freiburg, Germany. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce you to our session and introducer for today. That's Paulette Middleton. Paulette is a true advocate for the rapid transformation of the global energy systems to renewable energy for all, used efficiently and wisely. Paulette's professional experience includes leadership positions at the University of Texas, the National Center for Atmospheric Research Science Center, and her own um, company, Panorama Pathways. Paulette has been a trusted ISIS board member for many years, and she has greatly supported this event in coming together ever since the idea of the Solar Congress at 50 was born several years ago. Paulette, I'm now happy to hand over to you. Hi, I'm joined by one of our panelists, Finn. We're, we're all trying to get going here. Uh, so, first of all, welcome everyone from all over the world to this uh, Solar World Congress 50, the celebration of so the Solar Celebration Virtual Conference. And as Arabella has already said, this is session five, public policy and financial advances. So I'd like to start with uh, just a few very brief introductory remarks. You know, first and foremost, I just wanna say I'm so very proud to be part of this very productive, passionate ISIS global community and my country section, ASIS. You know, for over the past 60 years, the members of ISIS have undertaken technical research, product development, and advocacy for the growth of solar and renewable energy technologies. SWC 50 is a celebration of what has been achieved over the past 50 years. SWC 50 is also a discussion of what needs to happen over the next 50 years with emphasis on the next 10 years. Through this conference and related ongoing SWC 50 Museum and Booklet, ISIS aims to provide resources to help us all accelerate the transformation to a 100% renewable energy world. Now, please note that you will be able to review the booklet, visit the museum, and view all of the conference recordings soon after this conference. So, who made Solar World Congress 50 possible? First, we would like to thank our platinum partners, GSES from Australia and NREL from the US, and our gold partner, Smart Energy from Turkey, and our 20 organizational supporters and all of the organizers and contributors who are listed in the booklet and museum. Now, on to this session. As all of the sessions in this virtual conference, session five addresses important aspects of the energy transformation. In our first four sessions, we discuss the history of solar and futures, technology innovations, transforming the energy sector, and transforming the heating and cooling sector. This session delves into the critical roles of public support, policy developments, and financial markets in accelerating the transformation. And accelerate the transformation we must, the growing climate crisis and its harmful impacts on human health and welfare and the environment demand dramatic actions. We know we need to swiftly reduce fossil fuel emissions, among other things. The global pandemic, while a horrible blow to humanity, is providing us an opportunity for restructuring the successful revamping of our energy, societal, and economic systems in ways that result in a better, sustainable, vibrant world for all. You know, I'm very optimistic that working together, we can create new paths forward that will provide meaningful jobs for everyone, value efficient and wise use of energy, and be founded on JEDI principles. That's justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. In this session, our moderator and panelists will be looking back at the evolution and looking toward the revolution in public support, policy development, and financial markets. 
critical to the success of the transformation to a renewable energy world for all. We are very pleased to have Mike Eckhart as our moderator. Mike is familiar with all aspects of the topics to be covered today. He has been an integral part of the grand evolution of renewable energy over the past 50 years and is an important guide for our future. We're also excited to have Jonathan Silver, Helen Watt, and Sven Teske as our panelists. Each will provide unique and profound insights, and I'm looking forward to this very much. I invite you all in the audience to join the conversation by submitting questions uh, through the Q&A box. Now, I will hand the mic over to Mike. Okay, thank you, Paulette. Uh, this is Mike Eckhart. I don't think my video is up, but my is my uh, audio coming through? There we go. Audio is coming through. Yeah, okay. I think we're there. Good. Well, as Paulette said, I welcome you to the uh, to the session. Well, welcome everybody, and uh, this is going to be a really interesting discussion of where we've been for the past 50 years and where we're going for the next 50 years, and particularly on the subjects of public support, uh, policy development, and advancement of financial markets. And we do have a wonderful panel for discussing this. Uh, Jonathan uh, Silver, you and I have known each other for over 10 years. Sven Teske, you and, you and I have known each other for over 25 years. And Helen, we're just getting to meet. So it's, we've got a range of relationships at work here. And I look forward to it very much. I'd like to uh, get everybody on the air as soon as possible. I'll come back to this slide. Everybody can study this slide because uh, it takes more than five minutes to really under, to really appreciate it. And I'll come back and I'll speak forth. So let me just ask for opening remarks, opening remarks from each of the speakers on the order of two minutes. Uh, just tell us where your head is, where you're coming from on these subjects, and. Uh, what you want to say to the audience on public policy, policy development, and financial markets over the past uh, 50 years, and what was your role in it? So let's let's start with Sven because uh, you've been at this longer. Uh, you were at this before I got after this in 1995. So Sven, what are your opening remarks? Yeah, um, I yeah, my name is uh, Santesca. I'm uh, based in Australia, as uh, you probably hear. I'm not originally Australian. I'm uh, German, so I'm uh, um, basically now have two different views. Um, I started as a student activist, actually, to um, support solar photovoltaics in 1994, um, and at that time. Uh, we ran a campaign uh, with Greenpeace to, um, to give a proof that there is a market in Germany for solar PV um, as big as five megawatts for the entire country. Um, and that's laughable right now, but at that time it was huge. So um, we started campaigning for, um, for feed-in tariffs for solar, we, we started for uh, campaigning for political support, um, and uh, it was actually an uphill battle because at that time uh, solar PV was about um, like two dollars per kilowatt hour. Um, so it was totally impossible um, to convince someone that solar, it's one day, it will actually work. And um, I was lucky enough to witness how the um, solar market actually evolved. I um, um, worked with many, many other people on, on uh, policies, first in Germany, then internationally, um, and I moved further on uh, to go more into technical uh, research and technical um, concepts, and I'm now working um, as a research director in uh, Sydney at the University of Technology. I see that um, the the phases of solar PV uh, went in uh, always in conject connection with um, uh, policy programs, but also with pioneers. When you see the first people who installed solar systems, um, they paid 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars for a system which cost today maybe a thousand dollars. And those people were actually the first one who started some sort of a market. So I would say that. Policy was one thing, but there were also a lot of really dedicated people who 
put a lot of money on the table um, to live their dream and have a solar generator on their roof. And it was, um, it was across the world only a few countries. It was definitely uh, the US, um, actually before uh, Germany, um, the US started with solar um, a decade before, I would say. Um, and uh, because Germany always focused on wind and solar came actually later. And it, it moved to, um, to other countries. Spain was a country which was a, a huge solar pioneer. And then it moved to Italy and then across Europe and then it went to Asia. So I would say um, it was a joint global effort uh, with always very dedicated people um, along uh, policy makers who actually started the market. And I think I stop here. Um, just for me, it was uh, interesting the journey to see from the to see solar photovoltaics from the most expensive form of electricity generation to right now the cheapest. And that's, it really, that's quite satisfying. Uh, it really has been a transformation. In the 1950s, nuclear power came on the scene, and there was a phrase used that the power would be too cheap to meter, too cheap to meter. All right, get that, too cheap to meter. Yeah. And it turns out they got the phrase right, but they chose the wrong technology for it. Solar is headed for too cheap to meter. All right, yeah. so well said. Helen, let's go to you next. Just opening remarks, your thoughts on the topic of the conference and, and particularly this session. Yeah, absolutely, thanks for having me here today. So I'm Helen Watts. I'm the Director of Innovation and Partnerships at Student Energy. Um, and so to give you maybe the nutshell version of student energy, so we're the largest global organization working with young people on energy, um, on the sustainable energy transition. And so we work with a network of about 50,000 young people in over 100 countries around the world um, to empower them with the skills um, and also the spaces to really enable them to accelerate the energy transition. Um, so in terms of how that ties into this space today, I think a lot of what we've seen over the last several years as young people have really been rising up in numbers around the world, demanding more ambitious action on climate, um, is that follow through with being able to create really meaningful spaces for them to be able to contribute to policy making, contribute to organizational planning within companies and within organizations. So that's a lot of what my role consists of, is working with um, governments around the world. Uh, over the last two years, I would say this has really accelerated. The appetite has just really grown to work with young people. Um, in really constructive ways. And so a lot of we, what we do is kind of bridge building of that communication gap that still exists between um, what young people are asking for and how they want to be engaged with and the kind of structures and processes that exist um, at that kind of policymaking or organizational level. Um, and so we do a lot to kind of work actively with our partners and actively with young people to really understand how we can, how we can bridge that communication gap. And that kind of falls into an area of work that we do really actively now, which we call intergenerational collaboration. Um, and I think that's really where we see some of the greatest potential to unlock innovative ideas, outside the box thinking that we really need. Young people haven't worked in the industry for you know five, 10 years. Um, they really come into this with a fresh perspective and kind of bringing in their own, their own kind of creative and, and new approaches to, to these challenges, to challenges like the renewable energy transition. Um, and, you know, there is a ton of ex existing expertise, um, like we see on this panel today, of, of, of folks who do really understand how the system works and where the barriers exist and why certain things haven't happened and the timelines that young people are asking for. So being able to kind of bring all those players to the table is really, really important to make sure that um, we're unlocking those innovative ideas. Um, it's also just kind of a practical thing that needs to happen if we do want to ensure continuity of this transition and acceleration, because as you get more and more young people engaged in these conversations, you're building a broad base of, uh, of a generation that's really engaged on these issues, is already thinking critically and feels quite invested in by organizations and decision makers, um, which is really motivating as a young person to continue working in these areas. Um, so it's really kind of this long game it's both kind of the immediacy of unlocking active innovation from young people and, and creating that intergenerational collaboration while playing that long game of how can we get an entire generation of you know, 50,000 or ideally more young people really, really skilled, um, connected, engaged, motivated to continue pushing for progress on these areas and all of the connected areas that young people care so much about as well, like, um, like social justice and like gender equality, um, like reduced inequalities. So, 
that's uh, that's the short version of, of what I work on on my day to day and excited to dive a little bit more into that today. Well, what you do is so important. And in, in fact, I retired, so to speak, or quasi retired um, from Citibank and uh, just about a year, a little over a year ago to get a professorship to devote my in my 70s here just to teach the next generation uh, just the work that you're doing. So you and I are both doing the same work of advancing this. And, you know, for us old guys who lived the last 50 years of the, in my case, since 1976, uh, the clean energy revolution uh, has been our careers. And uh, so we kind of understand how to move things around, how to get things done. Um, but on the other hand, the new generation coming in that didn't live the last 50 years are free to think whatever they want. And they're not constrained by old ways of thinking. So there's advantages to both. But I, I lean towards uh, if you're unshackled from history, you can do anything you want. And I'm very eager to see what the next generation is going to do uh, for solar and renewables. And Jonathan, you, you came into this uh, some time ago as the head of the loan guarantee uh, unit at DOE. And you had a financial, you were the first person coming in there that had a true financial background. And um, uh, up 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 until then, uh, there was one person manning the loan guarantee office, and he never made a loan guarantee. Uh, it was just kind of there. And uh, and then you came along and hired about two two hundred people, as I recall, and really got a program up and going. And you hired financially competent people, and that was under the A R R A to burden us with history. You can explain that of uh, with the Obama put in place right after he, he took office. And uh, you did a heck of a job. You did a, a truly brilliant job. And I've heard that from Wall Street major players. Um, that if it wasn't for you, that loan guarantee program would not have really launched. I know when uh, uh, about the time I went to City, uh, City working with your team did uh, the $2 billion Shepherd's Flat wind farm and the two billion dollar i'm using round numbers two billion dollar um, desert sunlight solar project and uh, those were massive financially massive uh, projects and uh, you were at the other end of that making it happen so welcome and give us your opening remarks well thank you mike that's very kind of you i, I appreciate those comments and thanks for the invitation to join you all today um, you know, as Mike said, I've been, I've been involved in environmental finance now for a, a very long time, um, it, which actually predates the, the government's uh, investment program at the loan program. I, the brief, brief thumbnail is I began at McKinsey, uh, the consulting firm, and I've been in the hedge fund and venture capital world. So I've been around investing in finance for a long time. The program that Mike is referring to, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, is um, uh, the federal government during the Obama administration put about 40 billion U.S. behind um, the underwriting of and financing of very large-scale innovative clean energy projects, uh, wind, solar, geothermal, biofuels, uh, et cetera, in addition to a $20 billion U.S. Uh, fund focused on advanced automotive technologies. Um, since then, I've continued in the space. I, I now sit on the board of National Grid, which is the British utility. I'm on the board of Plug Power, which is in the hydrogen fuel cell space, uh, some private boards as well. And a good chunk of my time these days is uh, devoted to serving as a senior advisor to Guggenheim Partners, um, which is a $300 billion asset manager and an investment bank. Um, that is basically dramatically expanding its footprint in and around um, clean energy and the clean economy, and which, what, which is what I'm trying to help them with. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this really is becoming, in that regard, from the finance perspective, uh, a century of solar. Um, it's easy to begin a conversation like this on a, on a down note because there's so much we all have to do, and there's such a long way to go. Um, but uh, I, I think it's important that since you're asking about historical perspective, that we note that you know we've actually made very significant progress uh, in beginning to address climate change in general and in supporting renewable energy specifically uh, over the last uh, number of years. Ten years ago, you know, 45, 50 percent of electricity generated in the U.S. came from coal. Today, that's 25 percent and headed lower. 
Um, wind and solar power have exploded. As everybody on the call knows, I'm sure the cost of solar has dropped by 70, 80% in the last decade. Um, today in the US, which is the market I know best, you know, we produce more than four times as much renewable power as we did in 2010. This year, your utility scale solar is on track for a record year with you know, 14, 15 gigawatts of new capacity expected to be installed by the end of the year. Um, US solar capacity grew by almost a third in 2020 and on and on and on. And maybe most important now, we're gonna have a new administration in Washington that clearly uh, supports uh, progressive climate policy. So my point is not that we've solved the problem far from it, but we've begun to focus on it. Uh, and that's obviously uh, essential. Um, I guess as a matter of opening comments, I'd say uh, that's all great, but time still is short. I, I, I remain puzzled by the fact that everybody keeps talking about 2050, which is when all kinds of magical things are supposed to happen. But really from my perspective, we have until 2030 or 2035 to get this right. So this conference is a critical part of that discussion. You know, what do we do and, and how do we do it? Um, so some, some observations as I see them, some, some, some going in assumptions. Number one, uh, this is an immense challenge and it's going to be very difficult to solve this problem. It's large, complicated, uh, multilateral, multicultural. It involves issues of philosophy and ideology and it involves trade-offs in equities and justice. Uh, and and it's expensive, uh, and and so all of that generates a lot of intensity. It also means I think that we need to begin thinking both short and long term. You know what can we get done now? What has to get done now? Uh, and what needs to start now because it's going to be important later. Um, you know, in the short term, for example, public policy that can continue to drive change would include carbon taxes, solar incentive programs, et cetera. But longer term, we gotta be thinking about things like how do we continue to drive down the cost of seawall construction? We may even need to begin to encourage you know, people to think about moving away from certain areas so that there's not a stampede um, later with all the you know, accompanying challenges. Maybe the second observation would be that this is a global problem and so it's gonna require a global solution. Um, as a result, uh, you know, it's great and we need to rejoin the Paris Agreement, but we've got to re re refine the agreement so that it begins to have some teeth. Uh, the Green Fund that the developed countries supported as part of that process and part of the UN mandate um, needs to be fully funded. Uh, you know, there's a lot of all that kind of work that's going on. Third, um, you know, even though the problem is global, um, developed countries like the U.S., I think bear the greatest responsibility, have the most resources and need to take the lead. The faster the U.S. cuts emissions, the faster the world benefits, the faster we share technology, the, fat, the better off we all are. Um, and maybe last, just the general observation that everyone can play a role. Um, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Science and public policy sort of unintentionally got us into this mess. Um, you know, science developed plastics and fossil fuels. Uh, policies around cheap gas and zoning exacerbated some of the problems. But the good news is that science and public policy can get us out of the problem. You know, science working on more efficient solar cells, advanced battery storage, policy around additional incentives for solar deployment, um, simplified permitting better interconnection standards and the like. Um, and of course, all of that with the ultimate goal of making sure that renewable power is available to everyone, everywhere, and all the time. And uh, that I think is our challenge today and, and going forward. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, well, let's, uh, to, to the control room, could you put up that one page uh, slide again? Um, and appreciate that. Thank you. Very good. Well, I'm inspired by the opening remarks to begin with, uh, both as to what we've accomplished and what we've got to do going forward, as Jonathan was just summarizing. But I put this slide together a couple of years ago and keep updating it. And it used to be 40 years into a 100-year transition, and now 10 years later, it's 50 years into a 100-year transition. And the details keep getting added. But fundamentally, uh, 
And, and as I'm going through this in just two, two or three minutes, just imagine how many people were involved in doing all these things. And what did it take to get the market that we have today? It took a lot. And I'd say there were 100,000 people involved in accomplishing what's on this slide. That's how big and involved the industry is. So five levels of innovation is what this conveys over the past 50 years. Environmental policy, of course, is the underpinnings of much of what we do and started in the 1970 era with the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. I think the next significant break was the Kyoto Protocol in the mid 90s that really solidified, as Jonathan, you were saying, a global solution to climate change. And of course, it, it, it didn't work because the US never ratified it and signed it. And then we go up to COP21 with the Paris Agreement. And, and three months before that uh, was the adoption of the, the, the Sustainable Development Goals at the UN. So the, the, the fourth quarter of uh, two, 2015 was a pretty active period there. And then on technology innovation, that of course is the base of everything we do because we are a technology-driven solution, a technology-based industry. And back in the 70s, we had the Energy Research and Development Administration, ERDA, uh, which was, uh, along with other agencies, was, was merged uh, to create DOE in 1977. And I was at Booz Allen at the time, and the guy in the, the, the fellow in the office, literally across, a, a, across the wall from me in the next office, ran the project to create DOE's first budget. That was pretty interesting to see how it was done. And we laugh at it, well, I laugh at it now because the, the, the budgetary, the rule that Booz Allen put down to create DOE's uh, RD&D budget was barrels of oil displaced in 1985 and 2000, 1985 and 2000. If you if you displaced barrels of oil imported in 1985, you got development money. If you did it by 2000, you got research money. And if you couldn't do it by then, you got nothing. And it created, uh, if I can politely and friendly say, the liars contest uh, that became the DOE budgeting process ever since. So you can you can blame that all on Booz Allen, not DOE. NREL was originally the, the, the Solar Research Institute and uh, was renamed to NREL by H.W. Bush in, I think it was 1989, uh, which I think was uh, philosophically a, a meaningful name change. And the Fraunhofer Institute, not to take all the credit in the US, but Fraunhofer in Germany, and there were others in Japan leading the technology. And then the <clears throat> back to the ARRA in 2000, early 2009, was a massive increase in our D&D budgets uh, for DOE that, that sort of woke up a sleeping giant. Because uh, when Reagan came in in 1980, he of course slashed all budgets, but particularly DOE. And so uh, renewables really took it hard in 1980. And it was kind of the sleeping giant until, until 2008, when a big infusion of R&D money came in. And uh, as I say, and you know things like ARPA-E were created. Then market structure innovation. Now we're starting to shift towards outside of government. Government is causing some of these things to happen, but it's, it's not funding programs like typical of government. Market structure innovation is, in my view, the key and the core of, of creating the renewable energy markets uh, or creating the renewable energy success. It started in 1978 with PURPA. That's the Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act. If you've never read it, uh, well, at least you should go online, Google it, and read the uh, Wikipedia about what it said, because that, that'll be seen in, in the history of centuries as the Big Bang. What created the IPP industry, then called the NUG industry, the non-utility generation industry, was that law that forced, that ordered utilities uh, to buy alternative, what called alternative energy uh, from renewables and cogeneration with many limits on it. That was tested in the Supreme Court in 1983, five years later but it was already being implemented by then. But it created the industry that we have today. And, uh, and so, you know, policy matters. And then you go up to the, the, uh, the, energy, the Energy Policy Act of 1992. I mentioned that because that was where the idea of tax credits, the, public, the production tax credit for wind power particularly, was introduced in that law. And uh, the chairman of the Senate Energy Committee 
was uh, is on record as having said that we're not going to do cash subsidies. We're, we're going to do tax credits so that those 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 hippie developers of wind power will be forced to sell their projects to big corporations that make money, and they'll be run as a business instead of as a funny idea. He actually said that. Um, <laughs> And uh, so you get the attitudes that create this. So, so that that was the beginning of tax incentives, which has driven the industry in the last 10 years. I talk about e-trading, which is uh, creating markets. That was the, the electricity trading was put in place in the 90s by the infamous and, and famous Enron. And the, the next really revolutionary thing in market structure was the feed-in tariff in Europe, which started in Germany, as Sven was saying. Uh, it was Han, a man named Han Joseph Fell, who was on the city council of the city of Aachen, who uh, adopted a rule for the, on the city council that the city would, the city municipal utility would purchase solar electricity for what it cost to get it going. Don't try to set an artificially low idea, but just buy it for what it costs. And then he was elected in the Green Party to the National Bundestag and brought the idea there. And he's and he's still around. I, I saw him last year. And um, and uh, with the feed in, and I was a participant in writing the feed-in tariff. I, my only argument I won was to make it 20 years instead of five, because you can't do a 15-year loan under a five-year guaranteed revenue regime. You need 20 years of guaranteed revenues, and that's an interesting story. And then, uh, then in the U.S. back in the U.S. came a net metering as truly revolutionary. The, the idea that if that if if a, you know. A, person or company on their side of the meter could generate electricity, they should be able to offset their retail purchases rather than sell it to the utility at wholesale rates. And, and that, that means we're selling solar electricity at retail rates, not wholesale rates. Well, you know, the, the wholesale rate where I live is probably four cents a kilowatt hour and the retail rate ranges from, from 10 to 20. So a massive difference in the financial economics of solar energy. And these are the major things that and I'll move along here. Then there was just literally renewable energy policy innovation, where many individuals, whether they were lobbyists or industrialists or financiers, there were a lot of voices about about specific renew renewable energy policies. And the PTC I already mentioned, the RPSs uh, uh, I, I mentioned um, in the EU, uh, going back to a white paper in 1997 written by Wolfgang Pulse. Uh, when he was under investigation, having previously headed the renewable energy program of the European Commission, the nuclear power people accused him of malfeasance, that's stealing money. So he was put at a desk doing nothing for two years and he's still my best friend. And, uh, and uh, at the end of it, the chief of the investigation came to see him personally to shake his hand, to say that Wolfgang had been proven, proven to be the only person proven to be 100% honest in all of Europe because they tracked every penny that was in his program for 20 some years and there was no no malfeasance whatsoever and he wrote the white paper in those two years which became the launch of renewable energy in europe uh, he was a little upset with nuclear people as you can imagine and then the 2008 ara again the the investment tax credit for solar in 2008 but but actually that happened in september of 2008 under george w bush he signed that, and uh, and I I, uh, I had a conversation with him in those years, and he didn't object to it. And then financial innovation, which is a topic, and I'll wrap this up and get back to the commentaries. Uh, tax equity, yield codes, and green bonds. Really, a lot of that happened in the year 2013. The first yield co, uh, NRG yield, was invented in. In July, the first uh, solar securitization by Solar City, likewise, was in July of 2013. The first energy efficiency securitization was September of that year. So it's really 2013 that renewable energy reached the bond market. And if I go back to 1978 in my first study on solar PV, we articulated then that this technology needed to access the bond market because that's where the low-cost long-term debt capital lives. And, and 50 years later, it reached the bond market. So that's my one page summary. I uh, hope everybody appreciates kind of a sense of how do we get where we are? And it took a lot of work and didn't all happen at one time. And, uh, and that, that's, that's the history of it.
So it, it, let's see if anybody has any additional commentary on what was important and what got us here, and then we'll shift to looking ahead. Sven? Yeah, uh, first, a uh, funny remark. Um, Hans Uwe Fell is actually from Bavaria, and uh, the Aachen uh, thing is in Northern Westphalia. It's about like you call a Texas, a person from Texas, someone from California. That's almost uh, an insult. So he was actually from the other side. Um, and the, the um, the Fenian law was actually rooted much deeper um, and uh, earlier in uh, the wind industry. Uh, what happened is that uh, the anti-nuclear movement uh, started in, in the south of Germany and in the north um, near Denmark. And the Danish people um, already started to build some, uh, some wind turbines and the uh, German um, engineers, technicians, hippies basically built the first thing and then fed the electricity illegally in the grid. Um, and then uh, the utility took them to court and they were very happy about that um, because um, they fought on, in court and uh, they won after 10 years. So that was the entire 1980s. And in 1990, Helmut Kohl actually signed the, the feed-in tariff. Um, and uh, it's in, in place in Germany since uh, 1st of January 1991, and uh, the solar uh, feed-in tariff, the a higher one, um, came about 10 years later uh, when uh, the price was actually increased. But um, the, the, the mechanism was in place uh, from um, from, the, from 1991. So that's actually one thing which is uh, important to see that grassroots thing. Um, I was uh, involved in the, in the development of solar generation, which was a youth um, campaign for solar. Um, started in 2004, uh, went to many countries and uh, we campaigned on, on feed-in tariffs. But I think I want to add one thing, which um, I really appreciate your overview. One thing is missing, and that's actually the role of China. Um, China actually jumped into mass production and um, that was, um, not always appreciated, especially not from German manufacturers, because they actually, um, uh, the, the result was that the German manufacturing base for solar PV collapsed and everything moved to China. Um, but China actually reduced the price uh, with solar manufacturing so drastically um, that we actually went down this curve. And I have to say, um, we need to actually acknowledge that. Um, that uh, China in the mass production had a huge role to play. And I think I just want to look ahead. Uh, what we need to do, um, what we need to see now is that we have all the tools in our hands. The problem now is we actually need to use them more quickly. Um, I agree with Jonathan. I've, I've just finished um, a, um, a 1.5 degree scenario for different finance sectors. Um, among them is uh, the total energy industry, the utility industry, steel and cement. And we see that um, the, the first mover must be the energy and utility industry in order to provide the electricity, the renewable electricity for the other industries. So we actually need to have some industries as first mover in order to enable others to actually move in, um, like the car industry, um, the car industry is moving more or less um, rapidly now into electric vehicles, but it won't make sense if we don't have enough renewable electricity to power those cars with the renewable electricity. So we need to make sure that this is parallel. And um, I think what we learned from the, from the past, um, we basically pushed a few technologies, um, quite generation driven, uh, what we need to do now is we actually need to bring this together and need to think in systems. Um, also, the policies need to actually think in systems. So we need to address um, the, the entire system uh, of renewables, including storage, in, including demand side management, including um, transmission um, and distribution. So I would say that in the future, the mechanisms will be probably a bit more complicated um, than in the past. I, I agree, and uh, China is mentioned there. Uh, we, to I think, we all agree about what China. We all live that, uh, you know, how China came in. I'll quickly say that uh, Europe, uh, 
in a way bribed China into it in 19 uh, or rather 2004 the European renewable energy law that coined the 2020 20 remember that Sven 20% mm -hmm. yeah. uh, renewables 20% improvement energy efficiency and 20% reduction of uh, greenhouse gases so the 2020 20 rule it had three parts one was incentivized so Europe became the the, the biggest adopter of, of renewable energy uh, the second part was 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 uh, um, advancing the technologies and the third part which was a secret budget you know European Europe sometimes has budgets that are not disclosed the third budget was for exports so that Europe would become the export leader of renewable energy and it subsidized exports like 20 percent off well how mm -hmm. did China the China renewable energy law was enacted in, in 2006 by 2010 there were 510 PV companies how did those companies get those technologies 500 companies? Well, guess what? Europe was subsidizing the sale of PV factory technologies to China uh, massively. And so Europe actually paid for the technology that went into the factories of 500 companies in China. Anyway, yeah. that, that were, and, were, no, and the, the experts were trained partly also here in Sydney from uh, University of New South Wales, Martin yeah. Green, a lot of experts studied in Australia and moved back to China. Yeah, his 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 lead uh, researcher uh, w went home to China and and founded one of the big solar companies, right? Yeah, sure. and so forth. So let's shift now. Uh, any other comments on history, Jonathan or Helen, or should no. we shift and say wh where is this going now? I would just I would just make one. I think your chart is terrific and it really lays out um, in a very uh, logical and systematic fashion sort of how we got from there to here. I'd suggest that the here and the future, which also extends back a little bit, has one more element to it, which is really a function of, you know, Helen and her colleagues and, and cohort. And that is whether it's social innovation or simply social action, I don't know. But what has really changed is that a critical mass of people driven by, sadly, by people younger than you and me, um, uh, you know, have really taken the lead and taken this issue to heart. Um, I will give you a quick anecdote. Some months ago and before when we could all travel, um, I was asked to go up uh, to um, give a talk at Harvard Business School. And the reason I bring that up is because before that meeting, I was asked if I would meet with the Energy and Environment Club. I didn't know they had one and that was great. Turns out there are 350 people in the Energy and Environment Club. Now there may be 900 kids as students in the in the investment banking club but the point of my story is five six years ago they didn't even have an energy and environment club and so um there's this really fundamental shift and i'll, I'll call it a consumer movement but it's bigger than consumerism a consumer movement around green and clean that is fundamentally reshaping the way policy is done the amount of capital available for innovation in general, et cetera, et cetera. And so it may be that as you, you know, as you continue to build out your chart, we need to we need to highlight some kind of social something, innovation. I don't know if that's the right word or not, but the social movement around this. You know, that's a that's a that's a very meaningful and helpful addition. I I immediately listening to you, Jonathan, say, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna add a sixth horizontal line on social innovation that has happened because right? you're exactly right i remember giving at the uh, renewable energy finance forum wall street acors finance and investment conference held every year um i i used to in the opening dialogue i'd i'd always thank and congratulate everybody for you know 750 people at the waldorf astoria i thank them for being there because not one of them as a matter of fact had a degree in renewable energy. Everybody had come into the industry post their education. And that ended in 2007 when Eastern Illinois University graduated their first class in renewable energy engineering. <laughs> and I think there's not a university today that does not have courses in clean energy, sustainability, climate change, and a lot of them in finance now. So that, that has been a social revolution. And Helen, let's turn to you and talk about that. You're actually working full time on that very question. 
Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts about the social revolution that's happened and is going to happen? Definitely. Yeah, I think, and I really appreciate you bringing that up as well, Jonathan. I think that really speaks to kind of the fundamental value shift that we're seeing as well. And it's not to say that um, generationally that, you know, the values of having these more kind of system change solutions didn't exist. But I think that's something that is quite unique about this generation that is pushing for change now is young people really don't want to see. It's not just about 100 percent renewable now. It's about 100 percent renewable and a just transition and all of these other dimensions that are just as important to young people and that they don't see as mutually exclusive. And that's really, really important. That's why you see things like the Sunrise Movement really pushing for a Green New Deal and gaining a ton of traction for that in the States. And that's why you see lots of youth movements around the world, um, a lot of whom are led also by uh, communities of historically excluded um, voices as well. And so I think that's really where we're starting to see um, this kind of revolution happen in a much more systems way and is really, really exciting. Um, Even us kind of over the last several years, like our chapters program, um, which is our university and college led um, level student led uh, kind of clubs on campus. Um, that's grown from three, uh, we had, I think, four chapters um, just two years ago, and we're now at 47. Um, and that's on kind of a continuous, you know, upward trajectory. And so there's a huge amount of demand for people to, young people to connect with each other while they're still at school and really start getting a lot of this moving. And what we're also seeing kind of on the inside of the, all of that as well is what those chapters look like is changing. We're not just get getting the the engineering students or even the STEM students anymore. We're also getting the policy students and the students in arts and humanities and you know all of those different people who really want to have a role to play in this transition. And I think that's really, really exciting because that's where we really start to see those barriers that kind of those siloed sector approaches start to diminish over time. That's my goal, at least, is to really enable that kind of cross-sectoral collaboration and, and interdisciplinary thinking to really continue because that's where we get a lot of we get a lot of those vertical lines between your your horizontal lines there Mike so that's I think really exciting um, we're also doing a lot of global research on this as well so we have a global youth energy outlook that we're working on over the next year to launch at COP26 um, and we actually follow um, you know those three areas of policy changes technology changes market changes Um, But then we also do have that fourth line of social systems change. And so those four kind of areas are are being built out now by our youth community around the world to really provide a focused call to action from youth on the energy transition. So that's definitely very much embedded in the ethos of how young people think about the transition. Yeah, I find from my teaching at the University of Maryland and at Columbia University in New York, um, in the sustainable finance field, that uh, I agree with you. The the whole it reminds me of our generation, my generation, in the 1960s and early 70s, which is quite a revolutionary period. I think everybody knows, both in terms of racial justice and social change, and Vietnam, and so on and on and on. Uh, I, I I sense we're kind of in a a new revolution period 50 years later, where the students I'm dealing with. Uh, really do uh, combine the JEDI criteria with clean energy. It's, it, clean energy doesn't stand by itself. It's a whole revolutionary next generation of how, to, how do we want to live? And, uh, and I'd say it's led much more by women than men, um, the social change they're demanding. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, we're, we have almost an equal gender parity across all of our chapters of who's kind of leading those chapters, which is really, really interesting because um, a lot of the energy sector partners that we work with name kind of gender equality as the biggest issue that they're facing in terms of creating more diversity in the workplaces. And so I think like it's not to I think that is not coming from a lack of a pipeline of young people, of young women who are excited to work in the field. I think like bridging that gap and having that generational shift really change what the workforce looks like and what leadership looks like is is coming and and uh, and our programs definitely demonstrate that so we are just working to kind of keep that going as they move into careers as well yeah I, I made that comment on gender because uh, uh, those of us leading the industry are keenly aware that the renewable energy industry is very male dominant I mean, we're talking 95 percent uh, because it's engineering. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, that when um, I studied engineering, um, we had um, in the course we have 90 uh, students um, and we had um, 87 uh, men, <laughs> three women, 
And yeah. my, my son studies engineering right now, and they're almost 50-50. So that's a really good development. Yeah, when I went to Harvard Business School, we had 6% women. When my my younger uh, uh, sister, seven years younger, went just seven years later, it was just almost 50%. So that revolution happened in the 1980 era in those schools, but it didn't penetrate the engineering as, as quite as much. Well, uh, one of the things, I, let, me, let me go through some quick arithmetic about the future and the past. In 1978 was my first study on solar PV, and it was a comprehensive assessment of the, the commercial potential of solar PV. And I found out two years later, the study led, well, it led to a series of studies on, on rifle shot studies on each of the new energy technologies. I learned halfway into the four year series that it was requested by Jimmy Carter. And our reports were going to him. Seven copies went to the White House. And you know, he, it, those of us that knew that stuff, we, he spent his weekends reading things. Well, I, our report was one of his readings. The first study on PV, we did a good analysis using a Texas Instruments TI 1250 calculator and <laughs> a, a, a grid piece of paper um, to, calcu to, to, cal to forecast what PV would need to cost to be competitive on an energy plus capacity or energy only basis against conventional power. And the answer was against conventional uh, gas and coal, PV had to decline in cost from what was then, you could buy a PV panel for $11 a watt from Sharp in, two, in 1978, and it had to get to eight cents, eight cents. Like we couldn't believe our own answer, but that was the answer. So that's in there. Well, if you multiply by five for inflation, that $11 a watt today would be $55 is what, to Sven's point on the cost, it was really expensive. And that eight cents times five is 40 cents. Well, what happened in 2018? PV dropped below 40 cents a watt. We accomplished a 99% cost reduction over a 40 year period. So I want to introduce the new Eckhart law, which is solar PV declines 99% every 40 years. How do you like that? Now, <laughs> Uh, I thought you'd like that. Are you, going, are you going into negative? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so take it ahead. I've already done the arithmetic, uh, so this is accurate. You go out a, another 40 years to 2060, and with the Eckhart rule, solar, solar electricity, I'm converting from dollars per watt to cents per kilowatt hour, we, so, solar electricity will cost 0.3 cents a kilowatt hour. That's a 99% drop from where we are, because we're, where are we now? We're, we're at about three cents. So you drop this down and it's in the two point something cents. What will the world be like when electricity costs as little as 0.3 cents a kilowatt hour? And think about storage dropping over those 40 years. It's gonna be a different energy world. This is gonna be the too cheap to meter. And we can see it and we can predict it because PV is a semiconductor. And, well, and semiconductor costs do follow rules like that. So I'll take, it I'll, I'll take a stab at that because, um, <laughs> by the way, if it's 0.3 cents then, at your next iteration out, the utilities are paying you, which is very attractive. Yeah, um, very attractive. But, but leaving that aside, I, I think actually this speaks to something really quite fundamental, which I personally believe, and that is that over the next X period of time, I wouldn't begin to try to put a, a time frame to it, but it's, it's not short, but it's not never. I think we're going to want to see utilities essentially transform into insurance companies. And mm -hmm. what people perceive to be their monthly utility bill will transmogrify into being a, 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 an insurance premium. And essentially, the contract will be <clears throat> that the insurance company, the <clears throat> excuse me, utility will guarantee that you will never go dark, that should your, your own source of power or the microgrid of which you are a part go down, whether they use storage or flip on a peaker or whatever they do, they will ensure that you, that you, uh, that you have power. But it's an insurance product. It's not the delivery of power. And well, that's because- John, 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 
Maybe that's the first, maybe this is not the first time you said it, but it's the first time I've ever heard this. So I want to give you credit for a revolutionary idea. Hi, everybody. This is the control room speaking. We have a few questions from the audience. I just want to remind everybody that the audience can send in questions. And so maybe we can get to that also. All right, let's just wrap up. We'll do final commentary before we go to the Q&A. Helen, Sven, picking up on Jonathan's revolutionary idea. Jonathan, have you have you presented this idea to the utility industry? Uh, not formally, but I I, I think the I, I I don't want to I, I know there are questions. I don't want to take this uh, out too long, but I yeah. think it's almost inevitable because it's driven by the get the Eckhart rule, right? Which is when something becomes too cheap to meter, there's no point in metering it, right? And in right. fact, the end result of that is right. that the reason right. it's too cheap to meter is that is that you're producing your own power. Yeah. No, I think you're on this. This is very fundamental to the audience. I think that this is this this idea will be on the chart uh, next next in ten years. All right. All right. Well, let's go to the audience Q and A, um, and please read off a question that you feel is a good one. Um, you have that right? on your panel. There's this questions tab, and if you pull that up for yourself, you can see the questions that came in. Uh, to the audience, well, we're dealing we're dealing with a new technology system that none of us know how to operate. So, well, I'm gonna uh, where, jump in. I'm where, gonna... where 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 is that tab? <laughs> Paulette, can you help us out with the question in the meantime? Yeah, I, uh, I'm going to throw out a question. Uh, first question here. Um, this is actually my question. So, <laughs> and then I'll go uh, to some of the others. Uh, so, we you know the, the, this this. Uh, session is also dealing with uh, public support. So I, I uh, appreciate hearing what what you think we can do with strengthening public support for the renewable energy tran transformation worldwide. What's uh, We need to get everybody on board. We know that. And especially there's some that don't want to get on board. So what do you see as some innovations along those lines? I think it's been a tremendous success. I, uh... Even 10 years ago, many people had a misperception of renewable energy. I would say today, it's astonishing how people have self-studied and paid attention and gotten behind this thing. Um, I deal with the nuclear power people and they're astonished. They talk all the time about how they would like to get public support and they're amazed at how renewable energy has gotten public support. Uh, Sven, you've been working on this public support issue a long time. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think um, we have uh, the support from um, the people we need, uh, but we don't have the support from, from the people in the future. Because um, if I just uh, mm -hmm. give an example from Australia, about 28% of all Australians, Australian households, have solar right now. So it's, um, mm -hmm. it's per capita the highest uh, installation rate. Of course, it's a no-brainer to uh, in Australia to actually install solar. It's, it's uh, have a solar installation because it's much cheaper than buying electricity from the grid. The problem is that, for example, I live here in Sydney, but I have no own house. I live in an apartment. So we need to actually take, get all those people on board who don't have their own roof. And the problem is, if you just um, um, sort of extend what happens, then you end up um, all the people who actually have enough money for, for their house have their own system. And those who don't have their own roof um, actually are still customers of the, grid, of the utility. Um, so um, less and less people pay for the infrastructure, for all the grids and everything, um, mm -hmm. because more, and more people um, sort of get disconnected from grid and that actually left over are those who have not enough money or uh, don't have the possibility because they live in an apartment. So we need to go now the next step and see how can they contribute to that. Um, there are many um, old concepts. I mean, there is this old concept uh, from Denmark, which is, I don't know, 30 years old, um, that you um, buy shares. Um, I, th I think it went to New York. They um, copied the idea from Denmark and gave them just a new name. It's, it's called Solar Gardens. Um, very old idea, um, but new name. 
and sometimes a new name is important to sell the idea again. So you actually uh, put solar generators in public places, you contribute, you, you, you buy your share or you get your share um, and uh, get your electricity. I think we need to actually have more innovative ideas. How do we actually include people who can't install systems themselves? And also, I wouldn't actually just focus on solar. I also would uh, include all the other renewable energies because at the end of the day, even if we um, have all electricity from renewables um, in, in our homes, we still have half of the electricity and more uh, from the industry. And if we have an electric um, vehicle revolution, then the electricity demand will double in, in a country. So um, if you move sure. from oil and gas to electric mobility, you roughly double the electricity demand. And again, that electricity needs to come from somewhere. And you need um, to get the people on board, which means they also have to benefit from it somehow, not, uh, not only financially. Yeah, very good. Well, the question originally was uh, public support um, that's behind all that. Uh, Helen, uh, talk about getting, quote unquote, public support from the next generations. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what are their hot buttons? Are we getting through to them? Uh, for do, sure, they have yeah. their, do they have to have their own heroes? <laughs> How do we reach them? I think so. I think it's a combination of all of that. And I actually want to build off of Sven's point, because I think what Sven, you um, noted is really, really important. This is a really big pain point that I've noticed from young people when we're attending events and we're kind of listening to um, speakers on stage kind of tell more people at the consumer level how we need to change our activities in order to be able to kind of be part of the energy transition. And a lot of what we hear is, you know, we're told we need to install solar PV on our home rooftops. Well, young people can't afford homes. And that's not a unique issue to North America. That's that's an issue of, um, of youth unemployment. That's an issue of uh, rising housing prices around the world. And so we need to really contextualize our messaging of how what are those roles that you can play in the energy transition um, from many different starting points and kind of really looking critically at what are the pain points that young people and, and everybody honestly is, is facing right now in the world. Um, and I wanna segue a little bit into, you know, what does this look like in the context of the global pandemic? Because um, that's gonna hugely impact what, what people can, you know, prioritize in terms of what's important to them and what they can what they feel like they can afford to get involved in in terms of pushing for public support in different directions. Um, and that's where I think the just transition conversation really comes into play here. Um, everyone's hurting right now because of the impacts of the pandemic. People have lost their jobs or they're scared of losing their jobs. Um, they're worried about feeding their families. Young people I know have experienced unprecedented waves of cancellations of internships, lost opportunities. They're scared for the future of work. Um, so how we name these challenges and what we need to commit to, but at the decision making level, what we are committing to as well is going to be really key here to make sure that people feel heard and they feel prioritized. And that's where they can really then get excited about the energy transition because you're contextualizing what they care about, their values, their fears in the opportunities for the energy transition. A big part of that is going to be depoliticizing the conversation as well. Young people, one like huge sticking point for young people is we don't want to engage in highly, highly political debates about the energy transition. We know it needs to happen. We're ready to kind of move into that next action phase. And in certain locations around the world, it's still a highly, highly loaded political conversation. Um, so I think how we kind of work to depoliticize the energy transition and talk about it in really kind of pragmatic terms of the opportunities it's bringing um, is, is going to be really important as well. Yeah, a lot of us have dealt with uh, big energy and oil companies. And uh, and in one particularly very very large oil company, uh, while I was at City, so I can't give the name, uh, I was advised in the hallway that uh, say, Mike, we we don't say the word climate change here in our company. Get that? We don't say those words. This was just two years ago. Uh, so there's some big attitudinal changes. I think the new generation has got it right. Uh, Jonathan, you haven't spoken on the point of public support. Um, you know, well, we've all got children and we, we sort of try to pay attention to them, but the next generation, what do you think? You know, obviously I, I agree with, <clears throat> sorry, what Sven and, and Helen said, 
but I actually come at it slightly differently, which is while I do think it would be ideal and, ne and is necessary to depoliticize it, I actually think that the way we generate greatest public support for this domestically in the United States and therefore globally is to create a kind of a moonshot race, right? We ought to begin by acknowledging, which I think is self-evident, that the United States is not the leader in renewable energy transformation globally. Um, and if we do that, then we have an opportunity to, to, to try to figure out how to recapture that leadership, right? How to, how to develop new technologies and finance them properly and bring all these people into the organization, et cetera, because we use it, we, we, we will view it through a market incentive prism. And I think that's critically important to moving this forward. I, I think without, without it, it's it, our ability to prove it out financially, economically, et cetera, which now we can by and large, um, we, we can't get there. What really has to happen is, I, and I hope the, the president-elect will do this, is to rally the country around a moonshot in this space so that we, so that the United States attempts, and I'm not speaking negatively about the rest of the world, I'm actually talking about how we turbocharge the rest of the world. The United States takes on as, as a goal recapturing leadership in this space because by doing that, we are so large and have so many financial resources that we actually will move the entire world forward. So um, it's not a political issue between parties, but it might be considered a political issue geo -global, globally, geostrategically, et cetera. You know, I, <clears throat> you remind me that uh, what caused me to uh, found ACOR the American Council on Renewable Energy in 2001 was exactly what you were just saying. I'd forgotten back in the 1990s when I first met Sven going to Europe and India and Africa a lot working on solar financing. Uh, I kept coming home realizing that the United States was in a, in, a, in, a, in a silo where it believed it was the leader in renewable energy. And it was the only one in the world that believed that the U.S. was <laughs> the U.S. was had appointed itself as the world leader. Meanwhile, Denmark is moving ahead on wind power and Japan is moving ahead on PV and Germany is moving ahead and they're moving to commercialization and markets. And the US is, it's, it, I come home to the US and everybody's talking about getting the next DOE contract. Like, whoa, what, you guys are a lot, you're stuck in the 70s. We've got to move this thing along. We've got to catch up with Denmark and Germany and Japan. And uh, that's why we founded ACOR. And we decided that in, in the Washington sense, um, everybody in Washington, most everybody in Washington is against everything except the one thing they're for, right? Mm -hmm. Except the smart people are just for what they're for and skip the rest. And so the founding uh, slogan of ACOR was we be for renewable energy and against nothing. You know, you don't have to be against fossil fuels to be for renewable energy. That's not an entry gate. You can just be for efficiency and renewables and clean and just make that happen because that was the attitude that was being taken in Denmark and Germany and, and Japan of just being for wind power and being for PV. And uh, back to you, Helen, what do you think about that? How does the next generation think? Do they think they're against something before they can be for something or can they just be for something? I think they could just be for something. Yeah. I mean, I think it's 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 sometimes challenging in this context to talk about young people as a homogenous group because there is such a diversity of opinions and perspectives there too so maybe i would come back to just making sure that young people are kind of continuing to be at the table to kind of contribute to these these conversations as well and and what are decided as kind of the priority actions to push for and the approaches to go for um beyond necessarily <laughs> speaking too much about kind of where they stand currently um on these pieces yeah, I know it's hard to generalize the whole next generation, but you're doing a good job at it. Let's let's go back to uh, to the questions and move on to another big yeah, question. I wanted to I wanted to go to the question. Um, what about inclusion of different uh, marginalized groups? And I think that's a, a very good question um, because um, um, we need to also think about um, some regions, for example, in Australia, we have regions where it's dominated by coal and people who work there, they're not necessarily in favor of coal, but there's nothing else. 
So what we actually need to make sure is that we include those people and organize the tr transition uh, to actually move them along, which is sometimes really difficult uh, because there is no other option. And, um, and I think um, also um, like in, in, in America, you, you call them First Nations, uh, in, in Australia, uh, the uh, Aboriginal communities, um, they live in, in regions uh, sometimes blessed with a lot of sun, but they don't really um, have any advantage to, um, to actually exploit it, to earn money with it, because um, in, in the case of Australia, um, there simply is no electricity grid. So uh, you could actually build a solar farm, but then uh, you're standing right in the desert somewhere and there's no, no power grid to actually transport the, the, the electricity uh, to, the, to the demand center. So I think uh, we need to, to go a, a bit more to where the people are um, and ask them what they want, what they need, um, and not just approach that totally technically. And, um, and I think... Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the major points is um, in also in education that we include more and more different um, educational and research areas actually into um, renewables, not just technology. Yeah, you know, uh, I really winced when uh, when uh, Vice President Biden made that comment uh, during the last presidential debate that I, I can't quote him, but he was leaning against fracking. And then he went the next day to Western Pennsylvania on his campaign. Well, guess who's the major employer in Western Pennsylvania? Natural gas fracking, that's what. So what was he implying that all those people should do? Go get a different job, move, you know, move to Texas? I mean, that was a real slap in the face and not very well thought out. So be careful if, you know, I like the solar industry because it's, it's, um, it's inherently positive. You don't have to be against fossil fuels to like solar energy. You can just yeah, like but I would, like, If I could just dive in there for just a half a second. I've always wondered about this. Again, I, I tend to approach these things purely from a, a financing and math perspective. In the United States, again, the only market I know, I apologize to members of the global audience. There are less than 50,000 miners in the United States. Rather than focusing hundreds and hundreds of millions and billions of dollars on transition and keeping those people alive and keep propping up these industries, et cetera, et cetera. You could literally give every mining family a million dollars, five million dollars, and still spend 99% less than you would on, on, on the kinds of things we're doing and trying to pass legislation and, and, and teeing up um, you know, movements, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, by the way, there are 50,000 miners today, and next year, tomorrow, there'll be 40,000 miners. I mean, the industry is evolving away in the same way that the buggy whip industry evolved away. And yeah, it, we it's, gotta... it's, it's worth making the point, but it's not worth going on and on about it. Um, so point well made. Uh, let's get back to solar. And uh, who's doing the questions? Um, um... Go ahead. Everybody, everybody's doing a question. Maybe Arabella, if you saw one, I, I saw an interesting question that goes back to this role of uh, the, uh, we were talking about moonshots and competition between countries. Who's going to get there first? Certainly, have seen this in the the race for the for the uh, cure to the uh, the vaccinations for the pandemic. What about uh, you know how well is uh, China doing? Its investments uh, have been very high, for example, in uh, in getting renewables, especially PV, going. Uh, what do you all see as getting getting this kind of friendly country competition going that that might actually lead us all to a better place? I mean, China has a target to double uh, PV again. So we will um, we will move to uh, they, they will, we will see that they move towards 400 gigawatts um, of, of solar. Um, I think that's that's massive. I mean, of course, um, it's and the population of China is like the U.S. and Europe together plus um, with a number of other countries. Um, so it's in terms of in, in sheer scale. I wouldn't compete uh, in, the, in, a, in a way of um, who, is, who has more than the others. I would more compete for quality and for, for um, a way to introduce it differently in order to um, 
actually make a difference in your own country. I'm, I'm working on energy scenarios for different countries. I'm currently working uh, for an energy scenario for, for the Czech Republic. And it's a tiny country, but it is so difficult to actually get something in terms of renewables going because there is a general to, uh, notion of um, making renewables in general bad looking. It's, it's just like bad reputation. So I think um, it should come sort of bottom, uh, bottom up to uh, in all different countries, rather than looking for a global leader um, to have a local interpretation of, of, those, of the energy revolution, because at the end of the day, you need a local um, acceptance in order to, to prop it up. And um, I don't think that necessarily small countries are desperately looking for large countries to lead. Absolutely. That's I, you and I have always agreed since uh, since we met 25 years ago. Uh, you know, my view of, of China is the, the very question is interesting. Uh, China would not ask that question. The U.S. is all about competition. We we watch football. There's two teams. We have two parties for politics. It's everything in America is about competition. Uh, that word isn't even used in China. They have a one party system. Uh, they get orders on what to do. They do it. Um, there's a you know a few hundred people that at the top that decide everything and then put the orders out. Uh, so the idea of the U.S. and China competing on renewable energy is very much a U.S. concept, but not a China concept. China is just doing what it's doing because it wants to do it, and it's doing it in in the case of of PV. It, it, the industry, the 510 companies, was created to be an export industry. And then secondly, uh, to do adoption internally, the wind power industry was created to, to install the, the wind turbines internally and has even today not quite succeeded as an export industry. So the, the, the idea of competition is a good one to think about because what the question is uh, to me is, what is the nature of competition between the US and China on renewables? And that would make an interesting discussion. Is it, say, are we competing um, or not? Go ahead, tell us. Mike, we're, uh, we're getting close to needing to wrap up, but I think there's uh, one little quick question uh, specifically okay. to Helen. Uh, okay. What is the most important need for young people and the emerging workforce in regards to a successful RE transition? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to touch Good on this question. really quickly. Um, and I just sent a, a quick message to the <laughs> to Morgan, who asked the question as well, just uh, in case we didn't get to it. but to share with um, anybody else who might be on the line as well. Um, I think for me, from what I'm seeing from our network, what really kind of propels them in the right direction with this, this movement um, is first, first and foremost, kind of regardless of whether you're in a technical field or looking to go into a technical field, kind of understanding that you have a role to play. Um, and I would say that kind of first and foremost, everybody has a role to play depending on, regardless of, of kind of what field of work you're looking to move into. Um, but the kind of practical steps I would take as a young person, and, and I have taken as a young person and found that it's really empowered me to get engaged on these issues is get connected to organizations with really focused mandates that you feel connected to and motivated to contribute to. That's really important. There's a lot of organizations and youth led movements as well that are unfocused and, and maybe have been um, have relied a lot on kind of consensus to get to a, a shared mandate. And that's really kind of held back the focus in certain areas. And so I would I would be really critical about the organizations that you choose to spend your time and energy um, in. Um, and then it's all about building those kind of leadership skills and composite skills. Um, that's becoming more and more apparent. A lot of different organizations, um, banks uh, in particular, I think are doing a lot of work right now on identifying what these future work skills are. But um, for the renewable energy transition, like this is going to be absolutely critical. So whether that's um, finding programs that enable you to develop your public speaking skills, um, programs that will enable you to really understand policy processes, especially if you're not in a policy field, um, getting experiential learning outside of the classroom so you can learn how to collaborate effectively and think critically. Um, that's going to be really, really key. Um, and then finally, I would just kind of touch on finding the issues within the renewable energy transition that really drive you um, because you can't do it all. Um, even if you can kind of continue to build your knowledge about all these areas, it is important that you feel like you have kind of a focus to really push for. Um, so, for example, for me as a young activist, um, something that I've really been pushing for is pushing the Canadian government to announce our nationally determined contribution, which was supposed to be announced 
uh, last month um, for COP26, um, but has now been pushed to next year. And so that's something that really drives me. Um, it's not to say that that's like the biggest priority, but it is for me right now. And so find what your biggest priorities are. Um, and I would also really encourage you to find people who inspire you um, who are working in this movement. Um, for me, when I first heard Rachel Kite, former head of the World Bank and CEO of Sustainable Energy for All, when I saw her speak first, she really spoke in a really honest and authentic way about the energy transition that got me super excited about getting engaged and involved. Um, and so I would really encourage you to like actively seek out these people who, who kind of get you going um, and will keep you kind of motivated and inspired to keep pushing with it because it's a long, it's a long haul for sure. Yeah, I've been inspired by Rachel as well. Well, thank you for that answer. We have two minutes left and I'm gonna give one minute, one minute back to the, the bosses at, at headquarters. So we've got one minute to wrap up. How about if we took 20 seconds each and just answered the question, what's your view of solar and renewables in 2050? Bigger, better? What's, what's the keywords that you think of, Sven? I think um, dominating, dominating the system. Dominating. Okay, good word. I agree with that. I really do. And Helen, what's your key oh. word for 2050? <laughs> I, I'll say for the people, which I know isn't one word, but I really think that the way that solar will be owned by the people is uh, is the big defining feature for 2050. Well, we'll count for the people as one word. So Jonathan, a word or a phrase, what's your vision for 2050? My phrase is it better not be 2050. It better be when? 2030, 2035. Oh, okay. Well, uh, an interesting anecdote is in 2050, my older daughter, Cassie, who many people on the phone know, uh, who does community solar at Clearway, she'll be turning 65 that year. So uh, she'll be retiring from renewables. That's how far in the future it is. Well, anyway, we're all doing this for our families and our friends and our society. I don't know many people in renewables doing it for themselves. Um, there's a few billionaires in the business, but not many. Usually it's uh, low pay and hard work and, and people are dedicated to it. And I love this industry. So with that, let's wrap up the session. Uh, I want to thank Jonathan Silver and Helen Watts and Sven Teske for being a great panel and great commentators on the scene here. Thank you for everything. And I'll turn it back to headquarters. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so uh, th uh, thank you so much, Mike, for uh, your excellent moderation. Thank you, Jonathan, Sven, Helen. Uh, you 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 def definitely delivered on wonderful contributions, stellar contributions. And I want to thank thank everybody that was attending this. Uh, there are, you know there are a few questions that that may or may not have gotten answered. We'll pass them on to uh, to our um, our panelists and to our moderator and perhaps you can have an online discussion that way we don't want to forget you please do check everyone uh, for follow-up messages from isis about upcoming activities related to the solar world congress 50 and other activities uh, also uh, we'd like to invite you to consider being a supporter of the uh, swc 50 through donations these will help make the century of solar conference museum and booklet as well as other ISIS activities, uh, even more vibrant and possible. So with that, I want to also especially thank Arabella from headquarters. Excellent job today getting us moving along. And, and thank you, of course, for all of your continued great work with ISIS and the Congress. And uh, Arabella, you may have a few finally finalizing remarks yourself. Thank you very much, Paulette. I think my final remarks are, again, a big thank you to the audience and to all of our speakers for joining. Um, I think we had a really fruitful conversation, really good discussion, and I think we are in a good place to close off the session. So I'd say bye from the HQ. And a reminder to the audience, the final session of Solar Commerce 50 is going to be today at 9 p.m. GMT UTC. So definitely check that one out. It's going to be a two hour session where we're going to wrap up everything we've heard in the past five sessions, such as today's. So that's definitely, I think, a very worthy uh, session to also join in. So yeah, until then, um, goodbye to everybody and have a good day wherever you are. Bye bye. Thank you, Arabella. Thank you, Paulette. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Bye. 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 bye.